Behind the Attic Wall, Chapter 10. Maggie stood alone in the corridor outside the sixth grade classroom of New Adelphi Hills Academy and ran her eye along the row of labels over the coat hooks on the wall. Alyssa, Barbara, Gregory, Sharon, Catherine P., Robert, Howard, Catherine M., Carolyn, Edwin, Randy with an I, Diana, her new classmates. She looked at their jackets, all puffed with thick stuffing and all stitched with little emblems from ski resorts. Alyssa's was green, and in an opening in the seam, a tiny feather stuck through. Beneath it, side by side, stood two perfect leather boots with carved designs. Above hung a striped stocking hat with an enormous pom-pom. The weather had turned suddenly cold and damp, and winter clothes had been brought out for the first time in the season, probably. The corridor smelled of camphor and musty closets. Carolyn's hook also held a long yellow scarf with foot-long fringes. All the girls had the same kind of hat, all of them, long wool pull-ons with huge pom-poms, some green and blue, some red and black, the nicest, violet and lemon. They hung one beside the other like a string of pennants on a ship. Maggie lifted the violet and lemon one from its hook and pulled it over her head, swinging it around so that the pom-pom banged against her ears and then dragged on the floor like an elephant's trunk. Inside, the teacher was explaining Maggie's situation to the boys and girls in her class. There hadn't been time to warn them that there would be a new girl arriving that day. Maggie had been brought to school at the wrong hour, and she was asked to wait in the hall while everybody was given the lecture teachers always gave about being kind to newcomers, especially when they were like Maggie. She ran her foot along the floor molding and gazed at the row of clothing spread across the wall. Hat, jacket, and boots for Alyssa. Hat, jacket, and boots for Barbara. Jacket, no hat, no boots for Gregory. Just like paper doll outfits. And Maggie thought now of the little paper dresses and coats, each with a name imprinted on a shoulder tab that her old roommate would attach to little cardboard boys and girls in monogrammed underwear lined up along the windowsill. What would it be? What would they be like, she wondered, the real boys and girls who belonged to these hats and jackets on the wall. Slowly in her mind, she gave each outfit a body, filling in a face under each hat, a pair of hands below the sleeves, legs, and abo legs above the boots. Alyssa would have short curly hair that she would shake a lot, and a smooth brown scab clinging like a polished beetle to each knee. Barbara would have a lovely wire band across her teeth, and a thick braid that she would swing around like a rope. All the girls, in fact, would shake their hair a lot. Diana would have a fringe of bangs, and she would sometimes shake and sometimes blow from the corners of her mouth. That she would sometimes shake and sometimes blow from the corners of her mouth, scattering it across her forehead like a row of startled hens. Robert would have a fat, buttery face and creased wrists, and Gregory would have a face like a rodent's and small, powerful fingers with which, in two weeks' time, he would twist Maggie's arm into vicious burns. There were no extra coat hooks, Maggie noticed, and that meant somebody would have to be asked to share with her. Randy, the teacher would ask, I know you won't mind sharing your coat hook with Maggie, and Randy, with an I, would remain silent. No, she wouldn't mind. She'd be happy to have her shiny down-filled jacket with the embroidered ski patches make room for Maggie's brown wool coat with its misshapen sleeves and uneven hem. She would love to have her violet and lemon hat nestle next to Maggie's brown beret with its peeling leather band and torn school emblem. Randy with an eye wouldn't be, would, Randy with an eye would be Maggie's first enemy. Little fragments of the teacher's voice were drifting into the hall, and Maggie tightened her ears against them. The speech was one she didn't care to hear. The teacher would be explaining to the curly-haired Alyssa and the rat-faced Gregory and the fat butter Robert and everyone else why it was necessary to be considerate and thoughtful of Maggie. Maggie has had a great deal of trouble in her life, she would say. Teachers loved to tell about Maggie's trouble, especially the part about her mother and father. Both her mother and her father have passed away, they always said. They always said passed away. Then she'd start in on all the schools Maggie had been to, leaving out the part about how she'd been thrown out of each one. Maggie has been to many schools with other customs and other rules, and so she may appear a bit different at first. Different was another word teachers loved. Maggie is a different child, when hateful was what they meant. Next would come the part about cooperating. I know you are all eager to cooperate in making Maggie a happy member of the class. Happy member of the class. Then she'd get to the part about how they should all treat their newcomer as they would like, as they would want to be treated themselves. And she'd use a whole lot of words like ethical and understanding, and everyone would grow solemn. And if Alyssa and Barbara and Sharon and the two Catherines and Carolyn and Diana were like the girls 
and all the other schools Maggie had ever been to, they would be nice to her, at first, except for Randy, whose clothes would have to hang next to hers on the coat hook. They would all actually like being nice to her. They would treat her as though she were Mary Lennox from the Secret Garden, suddenly ushered into their midst and needing to be looked after. Girls always liked being nice to the new girl, especially if she, especially if she had a great deal of trouble in her life. They would even fight over who was to be her partner on the way to the lunchroom, and who would show her the way to the bathroom. Outside at recess, they'd all cluster around her, and Alyssa would tell her how nice her clothes were, her brown school skirt with its glistening grease stain along the hem, and her tan blouse with its split underarm seam, The one, and one of the Catherines would pick her first when they were choosing upsides for a game. It was always the worst part of going to a new school, the time when everybody tried to be nice, but it never lasted very long. In a few days or a week, everybody would begin to hate her and be happy at last not to have to feel sorry for her anymore. Pretty soon, maybe in two weeks, she would stand alone on the playground where today she would be made first player on the team. Groups of girls would form in the corridor, on the playground, in the lunchroom, and she would hear her own name, Maggie, and then a laugh and silence. Someone would imitate her walk, and now and then she would catch sight of her name on a note passed across her desk to someone on the other side. Later, they would grow bolder, and finally, her clothes, the same clothes they would admire today, would be linked up to her desk, smeared with glue. It was dark in the corridor. The walls were paneled from floor to ceiling in heavy wood. All the schools she ever attended had at one time served some other purpose. This one, her aunts had told her, had been a former country estate house. Never in her life had she sat in a normal sort of classroom. She was always reading about in books, a large rectangular room with a row of gray steel lockers along one wall, and on another, ceiling-high windows that had to be opened and closed with a pole. She had never known anything but irregular rooms with bricked-up fireplaces, window seats, alcoves, linen closets, and once a whole company of naked plaster cherubs dancing around the light fixture on the ceiling. And instead of gray steel lockers, coat hooks, and the wood paneling of the corridor, she, le she leaned against the wall and settled her head between Alyssa and Barbara, Alyssa with the curly black hair and Barbara with the silver bra with the single braid, Alyssa who would show her to her desk and be her partner in line, and Barbara who would carry her notebook, Alyssa who would gather all the other girls to her over the scattering of jacks on the pavement and pass secret notes across her desk to Barbara who would whisper her name in the corridor and imitate her walk, Alyssa who would who, with the point of her black pen, would draw a large X across the back of Maggie's blouse, and Barbara, who would squeeze out a scribble of glue across the seat of her desk. Maggie turned now to the smooth green sleeve of Alyssa's lovely jacket, and grasping it tightly in both hands, contorted it into a violent, burning twist. Tighter and tighter she twisted it until she would turn it until it would turn no more. She let it snap back like a spring coil. Next she moved to Barbara's sleeve, twisting it sharply to the back of the neck hole and pressing its cuff against the collar until she could almost hear a squeal of pain from the missing head. Down the row she went, twisting one sleeve after another into vicious knots until they all sw swung limply like the broken swing on its single rope. Any minute now, the classroom door would open and the teacher would step out into the corridor. Your new classmates are looking forward to meeting you, Maggie, she would say, smiling, but Maggie would no longer be there. And that is where we will pause in this chapter.